I think there's a very fun game that is gonna be happening. Hopefully not too loud. <laughs> Good morning. It's really good to be with you. Um, so I've been asked to, to preach in Revelation 12 and 13, which is a lot. Uh, and um, there are lots of rabbit holes I could chase, lots of approaches or angles that, that we may take, lots of things to be distracted by. But the heart of revelation is revelation, uh, a disclosure of the nature of the world we're in, what's really going on, who's at the center, and therefore what we should do as a consequence. And so my hope is to not be too much of a distraction this morning. Uh, and so uh, let me pray for us as we, we look into this text today. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. So two things I think that are revealed in Revelation 12 and 13. Uh, what's going on? and what we are to do as a consequence of that. So I want to spend a little bit of time on, on each of those. And depending on how you break out Revelation, uh, many commentators would look at these chapters, 12 and 13, and maybe including 14, as the kind of the deepest disclosure for the churches that John's writing to of what's really going on in the world, what's behind the scenes of the realities that they were experiencing. And what kind of story do you think you're in? What do you think is going on in the world? I mean, the, the news gives a certain kind of angle on an answer to that question. There's turbulent politics, there's unsettling social trends, there's anxiety that is induced by all sorts of advances in AI or other things you might be nervous about. There's war. Those are things that are happening. And I'm going to begin uh, connecting to, to Scripture in a bit of an odd place. I'm going to go to Matthew's birth narrative. Matthew chapter 2. I know it's not Christmas quite yet, but the world that Matthew knows is similar to ours. When he tells the story of the birth of Jesus, we have uh, a fearful, powerful tyrant on the throne who engages in all sorts of deception to get his way. You've got Herod trying to obliterate the threat to his throne in the figure of Jesus. You have a narrow escape to, to Egypt. You have the slaughter of innocents. There's lament and mourning. It's turbulent. There's unsettling social trends. There's anxiety-inducing circumstances. It's a recognizable world to ours. And Matthew gives us that account. What we get in John's account in Revelation 12, at one level, and this is just at one level, it's more than one thing going on, but at one level is the same account but disclosed so we can see what's actually going on, because things are not actually as they seem. Let me read for you the first few verses of Revelation 12. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. And its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness to a, pra a place prepared for her by God, where she may be taken care of for 1,260 days. 
Okay, who is this child who's born? Uh, we have an allusion here to Psalm chapter 2 to identify the child. It's the one who's going to rule all nations with an iron scepter. Div- psalm 2 is an enthronement song for a descendant of David. It's used across the New Testament to describe the, the rule of Jesus. So there's no question about who this child is. And so we have an, uh, a narration of his birth here. Uh, there's a woman who's about to give birth, and the moment that the child is born, he's snatched up to God into his throne. So we have the birth and the ascension and enthronement of Jesus all compressed into two lines. And so at one level, the woman who's about to, about to give birth, at one level, is Mary. She gives birth to Jesus. And we know from Matthew's account that there was a direct threat to his life the moment he was born. But what John tells us is that behind the scenes, although Mer- Herod thought he was just defending his own power and whatever, there was something else going on behind the scenes. There was actually a huge seven-headed salivating dragon waiting to devour the child. Now, what you get in, in, in this passage then is just a great example of, of what apocalyptic literature does. It narrates for us truths or events that we might get in other places of Scripture, but T- taps into our imagination to disclose the deeper realities of what's really going on, discloses that there's something even, even behind someone like Herod. Now, there's more than just Mary and Herod going on here because the woman is described with 12 stars, and she's facing off against this hideous dragon who is dis- described later on as actually that ancient serpent, which sent us back to Genesis 3, and we recall another face-off between a serpent and a woman. And so we have... Mary, who sort of stands in for maybe the people of Israel, 12 stars, but also somehow the whole human race. And here's the child of Eve, born, who actually foils the efforts of the dragon. And maybe we're thinking back to the promise given to Eve that one of your descendants will crush the head of the serpent. And is it a surprise then that in chapter 13, we run into a beast who is powered by the dragon and one of its heads has been crushed? There's all sorts of interesting connections between this passage and those early chapters of Genesis to indicate that the story here at one level has a very concrete historical landing place, but is also cast against the backdrop of what God has been doing through the whole of human history. And this passage is teaching us then to see more truly. It's teaching us to see that the events that are narrated to you in the news or that you actually experience, there's something deeper going on. There's a heavenly dimension. There's a heavenly reality. There's a, uh, a theological layer to the whole of life. John is teaching us to think apocalyptically. He's also just teaching us to read the world biblically. You've got these allusions to Eve and the serpent and the ancient Israelite experience and cast against, uh, cast as the backdrop of, of Jesus and his birth and ascension and enthronement. And all of that somehow is relevant for the churches John is writing to in the first century. Things are not as they seem. Things are not as they appear to be. So what's actually disclosed here in this chapter? Or these two chapters. Four things, I think, that are that I want to draw your attention to that are disclosed here. First of all, in the passage I read for you, we have this dragon who's on a mission to destroy this child. He obviously recognizes the child is a direct threat to him in some way. And the dragon is foiled. His plans, however well laid they may have been, do not turn out as he hoped them to be. That itself is really good news. We could just camp on that for a while because oftentimes it looks in our world as if the dragon is having his way. We'll come back to that. Second thing that's revealed here is an explanation of why it's actually hard to be a follower of Jesus. If you have your Bibles and you've got Revelation 12 open, If you skip down to verse 17 of chapter 12, we read kind of the continuation of the story of the woman who she's given a place to be taken care of in in verse 6, as I read. But then, uh, well, maybe we'll go back to verse 13. Uh, The dragon has been foiled in his attempt to destroy the child. He's then lost 
a battle in heaven has been thrown down from heaven to earth. That's the intervening verses there. And then in verse 13, when the dragon saw he'd been hurled to the earth, because he's been foiled, he's been uh, put in a straitjacket of sorts, he's lost a kind of a place in the heavenlies, he's lost a significant battle, he's been hurled to the earth. What does he do? He goes to pursue the woman who had given birth to the male child. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, so she may fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she'll be taken care of. And here's an allusion back to God's provision for His people in the wilderness. When they were brought out of Egypt, the, the prophets in, in Exodus talks about God taking His people out of Egypt on the wings of an eagle and providing for them in the wilderness. So here's the kind of thing that God does with His people when they're in hard places, as He did with the Israelites in the Old uh, uh, Testament. So He's doing here with this woman who is taken out of the serpent's reach. And the serpent does everything he can to get rid of her. He spews water like a river to overtake the woman, sweep her away with a torrent. Verse 16, the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. And who are the rest of her offspring? those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. So, what we're talking about here are actually followers of Jesus. So, obviously, the woman is not just Mary. She didn't give birth to all the followers of Jesus. There's something deeply multi-layered going on here. And, the, and, the, and the, the offspring of the woman turn out to be all who, who uh, with their entire lives, are pursuing Jesus. And the dragon is now devoting all of his energies to them. He's been foiled in his plans to attack the child. He's out of reach now. He's up in God's throne, ruling. So what's the next, next best thing he can do? Go after the people that are associated with him. And John discloses this to us so that we understand this is why it's actually quite hard to be a follower, a true follower of Jesus. There is a beastly personality in the universe that is devoting all of his energies to your destruction. So, the first revelation, the dragon's been foiled. Second revelation, this is why it's hard to be a Christian because he's actually turned his attention to the followers of Jesus. The third revelation comes in chapter 13. How is the dragon actually advancing this program, this attempt to, to destroy? Well, he wages war through two agents. They're described in chapter 13 as beasts. There's a beast that comes out of the sea and then a beast that comes from the land. And collectively, what these beasts indicate or refer to is power that is often expressed in the form of empire, but it's a, it's a power that is idolatrous and exploitative. It has another allegiance to a different kind of God at its heart and leads to abuse, exploitation, destructive impulses. And this is basically every empire in the history of the world is variations on that theme, exploitative, idolatrous empire. For John's readers, they would have heard this initially as a description of the empire that they found themselves in. I think you probably had some uh, introduction to this and even spending some time in Revelation already, so I won't go into that too much. But the, empi the, the, the beast that comes from the sea, okay, so verse 1 of chapter 13, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads and with ten crowns in its horns and on each head a blasphemous name. And the beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. And one of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. And the whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. And people worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshiped the beast, and they asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? 
The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. And it was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all those whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Okay. This beast comes out of the sea. Uh, There's an allusion there to Daniel where there's a number of beasts that come uh, from the sea and they describe various different empires. This beast seems to be an amalgamation of those previous beasts that described the empires of Babylon and Persia and, and Greece. There's uh, an empire being depicted here, an empire that is founded on greed. The Roman Empire founded on greed, exploitation. It was all about power. It had an idolatrous core. It gained its life on the backs of the peoples that it conquered. It exploited them, and it made a pretty good life for itself and the inhabitants that played along and participated in its exploitative economic system. So we have this beast that comes from the sea. And then John sees a second beast coming out of the earth who exercises authority on behalf of the first beast, performs great signs. What the second beast does is actually to get everybody in the world to worship the first beast. And most likely what John's readers would have understood this to be is a reference to the ways in which the empire got people to play along that the empire is in charge through the worship of the emperors. That the emperors presented themselves as kind of spokespersons or representatives of God. Not the biblical God, but the God of the, the gods that backed the empire. So you have the, the, the cult of the, the devotion to the emperors that was basically a whole bunch of propaganda for the empire. So you have like statues of, of the Caesars making them look like gods on earth and coins that have like images of the emperors, and then on the back side of the coin will be the images of, say, Zeus or Artemis or various different deities, and the, the, the propaganda is pretty clear. The emperor has the backing of the gods. Don't mess with either, because that's the reason why there's peace and safety and security and economic prosperity in the world, because Rome rules. And propaganda, I mean, basically what it does is to teach us to call things that are evil good. Hey, this is really good for you. It will turn out really well for you. And the empire was really impressive. It offered all sorts of benefits to its citizens. That's why the people in verse 4 of chapter 13, they're like, who is like the beast? This is actually great. There's peace. There's widespread lucrative opportunities in business and trade. And and, uh, and Christians were um, sometimes pulled into this. Sometimes they stood to gain too. The church in Laodicea, who is described by Jesus as lukewarm, you are useless to me. These are neither hot nor cold. Why was that? Because the church in Laodicea had this kind of private, comfortable Christianity that they had managed to create for themselves that enabled them to broker all sorts of favorable arrangements in the Roman world. Maybe they'd got good business uh, opportunities with their neighbors, and they didn't let anybody know that they were followers of Jesus because it would be bad business for them. And so they say, look, I'm rich. I've become wealthy. I have need of nothing. And Jesus says to the Laodiceans, you think that, but you're actually wretched. You're poor, pitiful, blind, and naked. In other words, don't be too at home in a culture that has idolatrous, exploitative empire at its core. You don't belong there. You're citizens of a different kingdom. And John evokes the, the, the beasts of Daniel to describe the empire that he's in because the churches actually needed that diagnosis. It wasn't self-evident to them that the empire was this hideous beast. They couldn't see it. That's why this is a revelation. They need John to actually draw attention to that. Actually, the reason why the empire is all sorts of... Uh, bears all these fruits is because it actually has the backing of a dragon whose kingdom is, is antithetical to the kingdom of the crucified God. But I think 
the fact that this beast is kind of an amalgam of previous empires also gives us good grounds as readers today to to recognize what John's doing here is not just talking about the Roman Empire, but this is this emp- the, the beast he's describing is the embodiment of all the evils of idolatrous empire that have ever been. And so there's a call for us as faithful followers of Jesus today to discern what would the equivalence be today. Any kind of propaganda that entices us to idolize human empire or any human-produced utopia is an expression, John wants us to know, is an expression of this beastly power that wants to appear lamb-like. It's one of the frightening things about the beast of the earth is that he has all sorts of characteristics that are kind of reminiscent of the lamb. He sort of has horns like a lamb, but he sounds kind of more dragon-like. Uh, we've got the head of the f- of the sea beast that looks like it's been slain, which is kind of a little bit Jesus-like, but but not quite. There's there's kind of these parodies of Jesus that indicate sort of a symbolic way of indicating that there's something about this empire that you you might not think is is all that bad, but it's actually really good. It's sort of like the lamb. It's doing all these these good things. But there's a call to us to discern the evils of idolatrous empire for our time. What might those be? There may be many things that might come to mind for you, just a couple of, of examples. Maybe something like consumerist capitalism, which has a lot of things that is done good for the world, but if we lean fully into that whole worldview, we believe the lie that salvation comes through consuming. That's the propaganda behind every marketing attempt, that you need this or you're incomplete. Without this product, you cannot be your full self. Or think of the the lie behind the the tremendous confidence that's been placed in our society at the moment in science and technology to solve all of our problems. Uh, As if technical solutions are the solutions. Google is all-knowing. It's all-present. It doesn't make any mistakes. Does that sound reminiscent of some biblical figure you've encountered? Knows everything, is everywhere, doesn't make any human errors. I mean, Google has kind of stood in the place of the kind of role that, that God would have taken in for some. And so in our culture, the, the effects of science that you might see in the medical field, like in, you go to the doctor's office to, to, to address things that might have been addressed in a minister's study in a previous generation. Can I pop a pill for this? Because science can solve this issue that's actually fundamentally relational or spiritual. Uh, Or neuroscientists, maybe in a few years from now, will be displacing counselors. Actually, it's just a few wires. If we can rejig that, we'll solve your uh, interrelational issues. Or AI, maybe displacing humans. The confidence that we are placing in technology to solve all of our problems, uh, where does that leave us? Where does it lead us? Now, there's lots of technologies offered the world that's really good and really helpful. But uh, what I'm talking about here is a kind of a totalizing confidence that we place in it to solve everything, laying all of our trust in it. Anything that you put your whole weight on, your whole trust in, and look to to solve all of your problems, is fun- if it's not God, is fundamentally an I- idolatrous and will lead to exploitation, injustice, dehumanization. And it's in this context that we read about this, the famous description of the mark of the beast, right? This earth beast that, that has everybody receive on their forehead or on their hand a mark. Um, there's lots that, that could be said about this mark, but at its heart, the uh, whole idea of the mark is that this indicates to whom or to what you're giving your allegiance. It's worship language, which is why this is a mark that's given to those who worship the beast, to those who worship the dragon. It's on the forehead and on the hand, or on the hand, perhaps an allusion to back in the Old Testament, God brings his people out of Egypt, which is a land, by the way, that would have 
been full of people who had amulets and charms to ward off ev evil spirits on their foreheads, like the serpent on Pharaoh's crown or on, the, on their wrists. He takes them out of that land and says, I don't want you to put that stuff on your forehead and on your wrist. I want you to bind my word. And to bind in particular on your forehead and on your wrist, this confession, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind, all your strength to take that and bind it on your forehead and on your wrist. In other words, your allegiance, your exclusive devotion is to me alone. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Deuteronomy 6. So John picks up on that imagery and says, look, the beast is having people declare their allegiance to him and his whole way of being by tying his mark, binding, branding his mark on their forehead and on their wrist. They belong to him. They have his mark on him. This isn't like a just a, a sort of a physical tattoo or something like that. This is actually f more, it's, it's deeper. It's talking about their fundamental allegiance, their devotion, and what they have in their deepest heart of hearts believed is the way to life, what brings salvation. So what's going on here then in, in Revelation 13 is the ancient serpent up to his old tricks of leading the whole world astray. And underlying the promises of life and salvation in this empire, or whatever empire it is that we're beholden to, um, is something beastly, is something deeply unhuman, dehumanizing. So that's the third thing that's revealed in this passage. The fourth thing that's disclosed so the third thing, just uh, to summarize again, is that the, the dragon wages war against the saints and tries to seduce us and, and defang and make us completely uh, useless like the Laodiceans through the agency of these two beasts, idolatrous empire and the propaganda that gets us to give our whole allegiance to that. So that's what's being disclosed here. But the fourth thing that's being disclosed, and this is the most important one, is that despite how things look, despite appearances, actually the lamb is victorious. We see this anticipated already in the, the dragons being foiled in his attempt to devour the child, and the child is taken up to God and to his throne where he will rule the nations. And I mentioned already, maybe one of the heads of the, the, the sea beast is crushed as an allusion, perhaps, back to Genesis 3, this promise that one day the serpent, that ancient serpent of old, will be crushed, will be destroyed. And we have fuller portraits of victory of the Lamb in, in Revelation 14, which we won't go get into now. So we have these anticipations and echoes of the victory of, of the Lamb in these passages. But really importantly, the victory of the Lamb is not despite the fact that He dies, but actually because He is slain. The really important verse in Revelation comes in chapter 12 and verse uh, 10 and 11. So the, the dragon has been hurled down to earth, the accuser of the brothers who accuses them before our God day and night. He's been hurled down. But then the brothers and sisters, the description of them, they, verse 11 of chapter 12, they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. This is how the saints have victory over the dragon, by the blood of the Lamb. This is how Christ has victory over the dragon. He wins by dying, by apparently losing. Paul makes his point, right, to the Colossians, that when the powers and principalities thought that they had Jesus on the ropes, it was actually in that moment when he was on the cross that he was triumphing over them. And so, in chapter 13 and verse 10, we read that the Lamb is actually the Lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world. This is actually built into the very character of God and was part of the plan somehow mysteriously from before the very foundation of the world that He wins by being a slain Lamb. He is the Lion of Judah by being the Lamb who is looking as if He had been slain. The Lamb is victorious, but the Lamb is victorious through, not despite His death. All four of those revelations are really important for us to know if we are going to then know how we are to live. What are we to do as followers of Jesus? 
Okay, so the, the first big thing is what is revealed, what's going on, what's really going on behind the, behind the scenes, who's really in, on the throne. But that leads into the, uh, the, the, the so what, what are we to do? And I'll make this uh, very brief. We are called to be faithful witnesses to the Lamb. That means that what you desire should indicate that you really believe Jesus is the victor. That what you do, how you act, should reflect that your deepest conviction is that Jesus is the victor. That the way you think should be the pattern that you would expect to see if you really believe Jesus is the victor, not the dragon. And this means testifying in our words, in our desires, in our way we think, and in our lives, testifying that the Lamb and His way is actually the most powerful way to live. They overcame the dragon through the blood of the Lamb and through the word of their testimony or through their witness. And, it goes on, they loved not their lives even to death. We're willing not to capitulate to idolatrous exploitative empire. We are willing to allow our allegiance to Jesus to take us wherever it takes us, even if that means the grave, because we so deeply are convinced that He is on the throne and that He and His way is the most powerful way to live. So, there's no promise in these chapters that Christians are going to be airlifted out of the midst of pressure, quite the opposite. But how do we live in such a way that we bear the name of the Lamb and don't bear the mark of the beast in a culture that is dripping with beast-likeness? How do we carry about us, as Paul says it, the aroma of Christ in a world that reeks of the dragon, a, a world that's characterized by exploitation and idolatrous self aggrandizement? How do we live as faithful followers of the Lamb when everything in our society points in other directions? That's the call of these chapters. You could say it's the call of the entire book, but it comes to a really fine point in these chapters, and it's made explicit in chapter 13 and verses 9 and 10. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This is a call for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. That's the call of Revelation, patient endurance and faithfulness. Hold fast to Jesus. Be faithful to Him, which means bearing witness to Him and His way of being with your whole life, with your desires, with your, th with your thoughts, with your actions. And let that be as clear as if it's branded on your forehead or on your wrist. Our allegiance to Jesus is not something that we can sort of hide under the surface to broker advantageous opportunities for ourselves like the Laodiceans did. Maybe you can get away with that in a kind of broadly Christian subculture, which Steinbeck has historically been, but those days are disappearing. Worship, exclusive allegiance to the Lamb, is harder and harder in a post-Christian society. And in a post-Christian society, we're trying to fly under the radar, right? And that situation is fast evaporating. So we need this book because our situation is increasingly like the situation of the earliest Christians. And that means when you're living with your devotion to Jesus, it's clear if it's on your forehead or on your wrist, if you're living that way, it's going to mean you come into conflict with idolatrous, exploitative expressions of empire. Because the dragon hates being foiled. He hates our very existence because we represent his defeat. And we are a direct threat or maybe it's truer to say an indirect threat uh, to him because of our association with the Lamb. So you think back to when uh, Jesus is on trial uh, with, with Pilate, and P 
Pilate is holding over Jesus the one weapon that empire always has. Don't you realize that I have authority to like free you or to crucify you? And Jesus is like, you would have nothing on me if it were not given to you from above. The empire has its one weapon taken away in that moment. What can the empire do to you if even death isn't enough to curb you or turn you? That's what John is calling us up to. That's what Jesus is inviting us up to. And so a couple, a few generations after John writes the Revel, uh, Revelation, one of the churches he writes to, the church in Smyrna, the, uh, the pastor, lead pastor in Smyrna was a guy named Polycarp. Some of you may have heard of him. And he's brought bef- before the magistrate uh, because he's caused all sorts of problems for, for the society there. And the, the, the people who bring him before the, before the judge say, this is the guy who's destroyed our gods. And he's teaching lots of people not to offer sacrifice or to worship. He's teaching people not to play along to the rules of empire. And he's made a mess of things. He's a threat to our business. He's, a, he's upsetting the apple cart. He's making the gods angry. He's, he's destroying our gods. We need to get rid of him. And Polycarp is given an opportunity to get off the hook. And he says in response, for 86 years, my Lord Jesus has never failed me. How can I now turn my back on my king who saved me. That's the kind of faithful witness that Revelation is galvanizing us toward. So we have this deep vision, a disclosure of what's really going on, and this call to bear faithful witness to that, to what's really going on, to who's really on the throne, to bear witness with our lives to what is revealed in this book. So we're left with quite stark choices. Either you're basically a pawn of the dragon, part of his system, or you're like a paratrooper behind enemy lines, neither of which is really comfortable if you're a follower of Jesus. To have you about you, the aroma of the child or the stench of the dragon? Is your allegiance to idolatrous systems of power that promise life but deal in death? Or is your allegiance to a crucified God? I'm sorry I've gone a little bit long, but it was a, there's a lot in there. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Amen. I go along regularly as well, so (laughs) you know that about me. (laughs) So please don't apologize, and thank you um, so much, Joshua, for that word. Um, Let's pray together, and then we'll invite the kids in to join us for communion. Um, This prayer is coming to us from chapter 11, so we've just been in chapter 12 and 13. Uh, This is at the end of chapter 11. Let's pray. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints. The time came for those who fear your name, both small and great, um, for their reward. And the time has come for destroying the destroyers of the earth. God, you love the world. And through your son, you have saved us. May we be people who bear this testimony as we go about our daily lives, As we live in the midst of empire, may we be those who testify to the fact that you are on the throne and that you have saved us through the death of your son. Give us discernment and wisdom to live your ways, O God. to bear this name um, and this word, your word, well. Amen. Uh, Bud, would you mind inviting the kids in? 
they have been having a wonderful time out there. I'm sure you've heard. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure they've they've played some games. As we come to the table at Stonehouse, um, I will read a liturgy for us, and then. When it's time for the bread um, and the juice, I'll invite you to come up the center aisle um, and everyone kind of just comes up. Our kids come up. We practice an open table at Stonehouse and uh, we will partake together. Uh, most of us eat or drink on one side or the other. Um, you can also take your bread and your juice back to your seat. Uh, we just ask you after some time to put your cup um, on the table to wash them. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Many will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all to share in the feast he has prepared. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered to us by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread and after he'd um, given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the death of Christ, that the lamb was slain until he comes again. I invite you to repeat this after me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let's pray. O oh Lord of all, we offer our praise and thanksgiving to you, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this juice in memory of your sacrifice for our sakes. Gracious God, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit on these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and the blood of the new covenant. Through his body and blood, we are united to your son in his death and resurrection. We are made righteous through him, and we are sanctified by your Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things under Christ, and bring us to that heavenly feast, where with all your saints we will be gathered in glory everlasting, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, this is food for the journey to which God has called us. Let our lives be nourished by the Lord himself as we come together at this table. Come to this table of grace. <laughs> 